Hello, my name is Diane Lores Benitez, and this, without a second thought, is a memoir of life in Franco's Madrid. I lived in Madrid for over 12 years. I'd like to read a passage from you, for you now. I liked our neighborhood of narrow streets, patterned sidewalks, and blocks of apartments, each with an individual personality. The air around the little park in front of our building was fresh, far different from the congestion of La Puerta del Sol, the gate of the sun, in the heart of the city, eight miles and at least two centuries away. Sol, as most people called it, was the historical center of Madrid. It had a Times Square, New York air about it, only older, with neighborhood street names that reflected their past, Calle de Bordadores and Arco de Cuchilleros, named for embroiderers and knife makers, and Plaza de la Paja, Straw Square, that I imagined had once been a straw-strewn marketplace. Unique shops specialized in hand fans or walking sticks and umbrellas. Others sold only religious vestments and First Communion dresses or buttons. It was the place to shop for mantillas and castanets or to snack on ham and chorizo in one of the tapas bars. Try not to look like a tourist and hang on to your purse when you go to Seoul, Alberto had warned me. The place is infamous. I knew he was thinking of the Gitanos, the gypsies. The name came from the word Egypt. The Spanish gypsies spoke a language called Caló and were synonymous with flamenco music. Lola Flores, one of the most flamboyant entertainers of the day, was nicknamed La Faraona, the Lady Pharaoh. And gypsy men with equally colorful monikers often made a living in the bull rings as toreros. I had never seen a flamenco pr production or a bullfight, and I would have gone to either at least once, but I had married a man who said bullfighting is not a national sport, it is the national shame. And he thought flamenco was for foreigners. The only gypsy I knew sold flowers on the steps of the market. Buy my fresh carnations, she would say in a sing-song voice. Come on, sweetheart, they're cheap today because you are so beautiful. We both knew she exaggerated. If I didn't buy, although I usually did, she would say, at least give me a few pesetas for breakfast. I haven't eaten today. And we both knew that was an exaggeration too. Still, I found something appealing about her good-natured impertinence. Once, when she gave me her no breakfast story, I went to the market and came back with a bottle of milk and two sweet rolls. Thanks, blue eyes, she said. She made me laugh. But the gypsies at Seoul that Alberto cautioned me about were something else. I couldn't pick them out at first, but I soon learned to spot them. Silent as shadows, they slipped through the crowds, their eyes alert for a pocket to pick. They preyed on tourists. Undetected, they committed their thievery right under the noses of the Guardia Civil, who stood at the entrance to the Ministry of the Interior. Franco's civil guard, in their distinctive olive green uniforms, polished boots, and black patent leather hats, were as common as signposts. They patrolled country roads on horseback or stood sentry in front of official buildings. The three-story red brick building that commanded one side of La Puerta del Sol was built in 1768 as the main post office. In the 19th century, it was converted to the ministry. The day I went to renew my residency permit, before the local authorities issued me a Spanish passport, insisting my marriage to Senor Benitez automatically made me Spanish too. I didn't know the building also served as the headquarters for Franco's security police and a prison for political dissidents. 
The section I visited looked like any other dimly lit government office, and I went about my business unaware of its grisly activities. How could I have known about the mysterious so-called suicides? The university boy who threw himself from a window with his hands and feet bound? Or the old man who refused even to walk by the building because, he said, he could still hear screams? No one talked about this dark side of the regime. The war that had ended nearly 30 years earlier had nothing to do with me, and the generation that had suffered most remained silent, willing to ignore or deny their history. Even Alberto, who had told me about his harrowing escape from Madrid, seemed philosophical about the aftermath. Franco still controlled the press, and his military parades reminded us regularly that his regime had prov provided over a quarter of a century of peace. It never occurred to me to ask at what price. The United States was saw in Franco a strong anti-communist ally, and the two countries formed agreements that allowed the construction of three U.S. military bases on Spanish soil. All I saw was a country that appeared to have come to terms with its civil war. I slipped happily into the world of my husband's family and into his circle, a generation of educated people building Franco's new Spain. My husband designed and implemented Franco's infrastructure with enthusiasm, and the only unrest I saw was blamed on Basque separatists, and in that case, as Alberto pointed out, we needed Franco to squash them and hold the country together. If there was another side to the regime, I couldn't see it, just as I hadn't seen the gypsies. No one spoke about torture or reprisals or common graves, not even in whispers. Years later, long after Franco's death and interment in the Valley of the Fallen, I found an answer to my unasked question in a Spanish newspaper. We were tired, the journalist wrote. We exchanged everything for peace and security and white bread, and we lived in exile in our own country.